I'm going to give you guys an opportunity for kind of a closing remark. Um, you know, really, what's your observation? Um, and I'm going to let you go first, Angelus. What's, what's the, your observation that is changing the most rapidly in the ovarian cancer treatment space? Well, it's the access to these novel therapies. I mean, we went how many years without any FDA approvals? I think the last one was, was it 2006 yep. with gemcitabine mm -hmm. and carboplatinum? And those yeah. were just, those were two chemotherapy drugs that we got approval, but I think most people were utilizing them anyway. And then to get access to these drugs that I do think have made a difference for our patients, given us an additional tool in our toolbox to use to treat women with ovarian cancer. And we've seen over time incremental gains in overall survival for women with ovarian cancer. And it's exciting because we just, December 6th, got bevacizumab, mm -hmm. okay, platinum sensitive. February 23rd, this is a PDUFA date for Recaprib. We have Solo 2 coming for Olaprib and then Nova for Nuraprib. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's, it's hard to keep track of it. So. Mm -hmm. Katie, what do you think is your most exciting uh, thing as this field rapidly evolves? I think there's so many exciting things, but I think the thing I'm interested in figuring out, and Rob and I are going to have a spirited discussion about this, <laughs> is you know, we have the NOVA data, so we're all excited to use Neriparib in maintenance uh, and, and Solo 2. Um, and then we have very compelling data that it's effective as a single agent for treatment. And so I think the big one of the big questions right now is, is the sequence question that you alluded yes. to is, is it, in the past, you know, who cared if you have docs before Jeb, before Taxol, you were gonna <laughs> use them all, right? But now, maybe it doesn't matter, but it, we need to figure out if treating small volume disease and maintenance um, makes more sense, or do you set people up for these reversion mutations in BRCA, mm -hmm. and so then make them less likely to respond to maybe PARP inhibitors later or even other chemotherapy later, and you should reserve PARP inhibitors for larger volume right. recurrences, or if you treat larger volume, are you more likely to get a reversion mutation there? I don't think I know that information yet, so what's the most effective way, place to use them and the safest? I think there's a, they cross a little bit, yeah. and I don't know that we understand that yet. So sequencing. Sequence is important. And so, Rob, it is, may be important. Is, 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 your, is it about drug resistance? We haven't really talked about drug resistance. Is mm -hmm. that really what needs to, because we need to work on? Because tumors in the end become resistant to all of these agents. Correct. Yeah, I think, um, I think resistance and augmentation are the two uh, big areas of, of going forward. I think, yes, yeah, Angel's what she's really excited about. And I think, I think that, you know, um, one of the reasons we're having this discussion and is because We've been, industry is engaged in this in this in this process because FDA has has decided to work with us in looking at alternative endpoints that can lead to these regulatory approvals. So that has brought an influx of desire yes. to match with the explosion of science. Yeah. So talking about you know which are the best combinations, talking about what do we do in resistance how to measure that in real time. Like, if you could know that every cycle, what was going on as a response to your intervention, and you could alter therapy, maybe we would have these mini PFS gains on all these different regimens we would use in sequence, right. because it was informed by something we did along the way. So to me, that's what's exciting. I'm super excited about all of these specific areas, because they're linked to science that makes a lot of sense and we can interrogate, and we have interested partners because right. we have a light at the end of the tunnel. So that is very exciting to me. I'm interested in biomarkers. That's what I'm excited about. You know, as you know, I've worked on bevacizumab for a long time, mm -hmm. and it was always in unselected patients, and right. quite frankly, it really didn't work that well. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in the fact that the HRD biomarker, which predicts PARP inhibition, also shows neoantigens and maybe mm -hmm. increase in mutational burden, and there might be, I don't mean to overstate it, a cure mm -hmm. for some patients in that common biomarker for a combination of IO and uh, PARP yeah. inhibitors, mm -hmm. but that, that's what I'm uh, interested in. So Tom, you have been, uh, and I want to thank you publicly for your uh, leading the FDA consensus conference, uh, for spearheading SGO uh, papers, white papers on regulatory approval. Um, and out of respect, I want to give you the, the final word. Well, I, you know, you, you were going to ask what's exciting. I think one of the things that's really exciting is um, what taking everything that you all said, and Rob, you said it well in terms of the explosion of the science, 
We also have an explosion of our ability to manage big data right. and to look at that. And we've had a real change, a paradigm shift, and I know that phrase is overused, but it really has occurred in terms of how we conduct clinical trials and how they're going to look in the future. So we're looking for bigger deltas, bigger changes. Uh, we can do that with less of our most valuable resource, and that's our patients. Yeah. And it, it, it's exciting because we have so many possibilities now. All those combinations are multifactorial. Mm -hmm. So how do we put these PARPs together? How do we put these immunotherapeutics together? How do we put anti-angiogenesis together? And we're going to have to leverage that to the best benefit of our patients. And we, I think we're coming to the point where our clinical trial design mechanism will be able to live up to that daunting challenge. So uh, thank you for that, Tom and Katie. Angelus and Rob, uh, and for you, the audience, I want to thank you for tuning in. So long for now.